Now, last uh, week, we did look at Nehemiah. Today, we're going to be looking in the book of 1 Samuel. And uh, just as last week, I made such a point of how uh, beneficial it is to preach verse by verse through books of the Bible. Um, yet there is value in also in preaching topical sermons uh, when, when the need arises. And today is that day. Uh, today is the day I'm going to preach a topical sermon uh, and, uh, regarding uh, Mother's Day. Now, typically in Mother's Day, in the, for 20 years, I did preach traditional Mother's Day type sermons. And then after about 20 years of preaching, I got I kind of running short of ideas of how many Proverbs 31 messages I'm going to preach and how many messages I'm going to preach about motherhood 20-something times. And so then I just went, I stopped doing that. I, start, I started just going through whatever book I was going through at the time. And um, it's been a while, so then I decided that, you know, I felt led to preach today a topical study. And so there is benefit to go through topical studies as well, and that's what we're going to do today. So uh, let's pray before we begin. Father, we uh, thank you that today is a day we can remember uh, what our mothers have meant to us. And we who are our mothers, uh, are, uh, the things that uh, we are challenged and, and encouraged by and blessed by as mothers. And we pray, Father, that you will bring a, uh, discernment and wisdom to us by your spirit and encouragement us, Lord, in our hearts, strengthen us and give us uh, your words because, uh, Father, your love is for us. Anoint my lips, Father, that the words that come forward would be your words to us for your glory. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. As always, I thank you so much for uh, praying for me, praying for your church. Please know that I do pray for all of you every day by name. I do pray for all of you. Um, and it doesn't mean I, I necessarily have a specific thing that you know that you told me that to pray about I still pray for you anyway so regardless of whether I know exactly what's going on in your life God knows and so I do pray for you nevertheless all, always and so I thank you for those of you who are praying for me as well uh, we are so thankful that uh, that's why we are able to bear the fruit that God has called us uh, to, uh, to give and to bear um, Today, I'm going to look at 1 Samuel, and it's, it, it may look a little strange in your bulletin. It says 1 Samuel 1-2. It does literally mean that we're going to cover a couple of chapters um, in, in 1 Samuel, chapters 1 and 2. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn there to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel is after the book of Ruth, which we actually did cover a while back. And um, we're going to look at some principles about motherhood in the scriptures. Because it's, it's one thing for me to talk about things that I believe is important in motherhood, but it's another thing just to learn what are some of the things that scripture teaches us about uh, a motherhood. And I think uh, these are very instructive to not only uh, mothers, but us as parents in general, or just as um, the church in support of our mothers and, and what, 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 it, what it says in scripture. So, First uh, Samuel, and look, let's look at First Samuel chapter one, verse one. And we'll, let's read the first seven verses there. There was a certain man of Ramathiam Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, and son of an Ephrathite. He had two wives, and the name of one of the one was Hannah. And the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to Yahweh of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though Yahweh had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because Yahweh had closed her womb. 
And so it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of Yahweh, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Let's stop right there. So a little background on what was going on here. In ancient cultures especially, in ancient cultures is when this time of of, uh, 1 Samuel was written. For most women in ancient cultures, becoming a mother, for women now, becoming a mother was pretty much assumed that when you are a woman, your calling in life is to get married and eventually have a family. Okay, And that was pretty much in ancient cultures your options. Okay, And so we're talking about 3,000 years ago, Okay, about 1,000 B.C. This is the time of, first of Samuel. 3,000 years ago when King Samuel was born, or King, or King Saul was born, but uh, the prophet Samuel was born. 3,000 years ago, now think about it, there weren't many full-time career options for women at that time. 3,000 years ago, there weren't many options for women in terms of a career other than motherhood. Therefore, married women who were childless felt they had little worth. They felt diminished in some way in that society. Though they were married, though they were of childbearing years, they they had the potential to bear children, if they were barren and they were not able to have children, they somehow felt of less worth than others who were able to have children. And how times have changed, right? How times have changed today. You know, if today, in our society, if you think about it, if a young lady were to go to, a, let's say, a high school career center or a college uh, you know, career center today, I guarantee you that full-time mother would not be one of the options recommended to them. Okay? No one's going to go to a high school counselor and they're going to say, you know what, have you ever thought of being a full-time mother? Or you go to college you know, counseling center? No one's going to say in your career center, your college center, and talk about future careers as a young woman, full-time mother as a suggested career option. How times have changed. And yet 3,000 years ago, that pretty much was your option. Okay? So that's the context of, of what Hannah was going through. She was married and she had no children, and the other wife of this, uh, her husband, did have children, and she used to provoke her, you know, taunt her basically. Hey, I have children. You're less than than a wife because you don't, you can't even bear children. And so, women are taught today, though, in contrast, because full time mother is never a career option that is talked about as as a viable option today. Women are taught today that they can only find fulfillment through a career outside the home. That's basically the, the, either the explicit or implicit message that young women are told today. That you can only find fulfillment in a career outside the home because motherhood in itself is considered to be just a challenge to work around. You know, it's one of those things that working moms, they just have to work around it. It's kind of like a burden more than a blessing. And so uh, that's the, the way our society thinks of mother typically. You know, when you go to a career center and talk among other, you know, women that if you're, you're in college and, and you talk about it, okay? Now, after, like, for example, my wife's mother, uh, my, my wife's mother, my wife's employer, my, my wife was working uh, outside the home uh, when she was first married to me. In fact, she supported me for my last year of seminary because I didn't make any much money. And my wife's employer, eventually, though, after a couple of years, they closed their company. Company shut down. And after that, we were already married at the time, uh, she wasn't really actively looking for another job at the time because, you know, we were eventually going to, we were on a process of me applying to churches and I was was interviewing here and we're going to come here and we weren't sure, you know, what, you know, uh, things were planned ahead. But her company closed. She wasn't actively looking for a job. I was. And so when I was sharing with some of my friends who I met along the way, some of my college friends, and they would ask me, oh, you know, so you're married now? Yes, yes. And what are you doing? Oh, I'm looking for a job and applying to different places. And what about your wife? No, she's, you know, her company closed, but right now she's not looking for a job. And I remember one of my friends, college friends saying, you sound like you're making your, mom, your wife sound like a bum. She's not looking for a job. What do you mean? He's a bum. So I went to my wife and asked her, do you feel like a bum? <laughs> 
And she said, no, that's why I married a pastor, because I know that someday you're going to be rolling in the dough. <laughs> that's why I married you, because she, I know you're going to be this rich pastor, and that's why I married No, she didn't say that. Because obviously that's not true. See, it's almost like we implicitly think that motherhood today is nowhere near the status that it was throughout history. Only modern day, his, you know, recently we think motherhood is just kind of like this thing to work around. You know, your, your, your career really and your, your meaning, your value, your worth as a person is really a job outside the home. Motherhood is just like this thing you just kind of do on the side rather than an actual calling that you can commit to full time as it was for thousands of years, especially here in scripture in the time of First Samuel. You know, motherhood was a big deal back then. And so in the days of Hannah, for a married woman to be childless was a difficult situation for them to be in. Okay, that's, what I, that's what I'm trying to convey to you. To kind of imagine what it's like to be in a situation where motherhood pretty much is the main calling of most of women, especially where, married women. And yet, for whatever reason, uh, you're barren, which happens even today. Some people are just not able to have children biologically. And so Hannah felt that her sense of self-worth was derived from having a family. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, it says, now this is after her rival, her other, the other wife that her husband's married to started provoking her and she made her weep. Verse 9 now, after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. And now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And she was deeply distressed and prayed to Yahweh and wept bitterly. Okay, you can remember what, why she's weeping. Because she felt worthless. She was being provoked. She's being taunted. She can't have children. What are you? What kind of woman are you? You're married. You don't have children. And then, so that's the, what the society has had conveyed to her. So she was deeply distressed. She prayed to the Lord and she wept bitterly and she vowed a vow and said, O Yahweh of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but you will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And so in her distress, you see Hannah praying to Yahweh, praying to her God, because she knew, now why is she praying to God? Because she knew that motherhood is ultimately a gift from God. She didn't know why she was not able to have children. Okay, that happens, even today. But she knew that even for those of us, or those who are mothers who are able to have children, okay, it's a gift from God. And that's why she prayed to God. She knew that it, motherhood is a gift for God for everyone. And some people, people are, ha are able to have that gift. And some people, unfortunately, were not able to have that gift. Or not unfortunately, but that's just the way that God had planned it for whatever reason. Some people aren't able to have biological, biological children. It doesn't mean you're less than, a, than who you are as a woman. It just means that's her situation. So she prayed because she knew it was a gift from God. That's what motherhood was. And so, in fact, in verse 20 of 1 Samuel 1, let's look at verse 20. And in due time... Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called the son Samuel, for she, she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. I have asked for him from the Lord. And so, Samuel, the name Samuel means name of God, but at the words, when you say it in Hebrew, it sounds like heard of God. And that's why she says, I have named him Samuel, for I have asked him from the Lord. God has heard me, basically. This son is an answer to my prayer because God has heard me. And so Hannah knew that having a child was a gift from God, as all children are. Because she asked for him from Yahweh. All children, mind you, are a gift from God. 
Okay, if you're blessed enough to have children, it's a gift. If you're blessed enough to have adopted children, okay, it's a gift. It's a gift from God. Motherhood is a gift from God. Being a mother is a gift from God. The children we are blessed with, meaning they are gifts from God, and it also means that the children that we are blessed with, as fathers and mothers, do not belong to us. Okay, did you realize that? That the children that you happen to be blessed with do not belong to you because they're not our property. They are God's. They are gifts from God. And so that's why when you see this prayer from Hannah, it's so important to see what she's saying is she's saying, you know, oh Lord, if you indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but give your servant a son, then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life. She understood. Hey, it's a gift from God. It's a gift from God. It's not my property. It's not something I own. Okay, They're actually temporarily given to you that you may raise them, you may love them, you may care for them. And they're not yours. They're not our property, but they are God's. And so children are a gift from God. And as such, parents are to be considered to be like stewards of God's gift. Okay, Just like when God blesses us with material things, we are stewards of those material things that God gives us. Well, God has blessed you with a child, perhaps. Okay, maybe you have, a, as a father or mother, God has blessed you with a child. That child does not belong to you. We are only stewards of what God has blessed us with, the gifts that God has given us, including our children. And so we're to be considered ourselves as stewards of God's gift. And as stewards, caretakers, temporarily caring for the children that God has blessed us with, as stewards of the children God has blessed us with, we care for their needs their physical needs, their emotional needs, their spiritual needs. Most of all, we pray for them because they don't belong to us. We pray for them, okay? Because we understand that there are no perfect parents, right? Who's a perfect parent here? Who's a perfect mother? Okay, none of us are. And so we pray for them knowing that we can easily mess it up. Okay, I mess it up all the time as a father, Mothers, I'm sure you can understand times where you don't aren't the, you know feel like you're the greatest mother at times, and that's normal because we understand that we aren't perfect as parents or as human beings for that matter, and so we need to pray for our children. Now, in verse 11 of, of chapter one, look at verse 11. And so Hannah vowed a vow and said, "O Lord of hosts." If you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. Notice how Hannah vowed that if you give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. You notice how she said that? Give me a son and I will... And then I vow that I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. See, that should be the prayer of actually every parent. That should be the prayer of every parent who was a believer in Jesus Christ. That our children would become lifelong followers of Jesus Christ. So in a sense, we are all to also to give our children back to God. Yes, he has blessed us with a gift, but we are eventually going to give them back to God as followers of Jesus Christ. Our children are to become followers of Christ. That's why he's given us the children and that they would serve him in whatever ways that he calls him. Okay? And so with Hannah, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 24 now, okay, verse 24 of 1 Samuel 21, uh, 1 Samuel 1. With Hannah, it says in verse 24, and when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of Yahweh at Shiloh, and the child was young, and they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli, and she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence, praying to Yahweh. For this child I prayed, and Yahweh has granted me my petition." And I that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to Yahweh. As long as he lives, he is lent to Yahweh. And he worshiped Yahweh there. 
And so what's going on here is that she said, for this child I pray, okay, back before when I was still barren, therefore, now that God has granted me what I, what I asked for, I'm going to make good on my vow. He is now led to glory. I'm going to give him back to God. And as long as he lives, okay, he's given to God. And so just as Hannah had received her child as a gift from God, she is now giving her child back to God, giving her child back to the Lord. And so for three years, because that's the time of around when the child is weaned, you know, they no longer need to nurse from their mother. Around th for three years before her son was weaned, she cared for all his needs, Hannah did. But the child was not ultimately hers. The child was never ultimately hers. He belonged to God. And so do our children. See, from a young age, mothers and fathers, for that matter, do so much for their children, right? From a young age, we do a lot of things for our children. We feed them. We, we clothe them. We change their diapers. We pay for their diapers. Okay, it's not cheap. We provide for their education. We love them. We discipline them. We teach them to love Jesus. Most of all, we pray for them. We pray for them every day that they would come to know and follow Christ because that's the way that we give them back to the Lord because, they again, they don't belong to us. They belong to God. And so what we want to do as parents, what our highest calling is, is to give them back to God as followers, lifelong followers of Jesus Christ, that they would know him, they would serve him in whatever way he calls them to. But everything that we do as parents, everything we do as mothers, everything we do as fathers, is so that we can ultimately give our children back to God. Give them back to God, just like Hannah did. Okay, they, maybe they won't serve in the temple okay, all the days of their life, and literally like Samuel did, but we do give them back to the God spiritually and that they will serve him and follow him. That's our plan. That's our goal, where they will serve and follow Christ even into adulthood. And that's the prayer that you are, you are to have for your children. Verse 27 again of, of 1 Samuel 1, the second part of verse 27. The Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. The Lord has granted me as, uh, my petition as... Uh, As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. That's actually verse 28. The second part of verse 28. As long as my child lives, he is lent to the Lord. For as long as he lives, may he know you, may he follow you, may he serve you. That's our prayer. That's our goal as parents, as mothers, as fathers. As parents and as mothers and fathers, do we understand this? Do we understand what our calling is? That our children do not belong to us? They are just temporarily given to us how many years they live in your house? But ultimately, you are to give them back to God as followers of Christ, that they may follow him all the days of his life. Do we understand that we are just caretakers of God's gift so that our children may love and serve God on their own into adulthood? Do we pray for them, therefore? knowing that this is our calling? Do we pray for them and ask God for help to do this? Because it's not easy. You can do a lot of the things that, you know, you think are the right things to help them grow in, in spirit and grow and feed them and you educate them and you discipline them, you do all the things for them and it still may turn, be very challenging. And, and in fact, it will be challenging. Okay? Who thinks parenthood is easy? Okay? Do we pray for them, therefore, and ask God for help? Because we know we can't be the parents we were meant to be on our own. Okay, we can't. I cannot be the parent I'm meant to be unless I'm praying on my knees every day, asking God for help. I cannot be the husband I'm meant to be without praying every day. Okay, even then, I still fail. I cannot be the believer in Jesus Christ that I'm meant to be without God's help. And so we need to be praying for our children as parents because you cannot become the parents you were meant to be on your own strength or on your own wisdom. And so our first point in your outline is that children are a gift from God. Children are a gift from God so that we will then give them back to God in the sense of being lifelong followers and servants 
of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? So it's like what Hannah was doing. Hannah gave her son back that was she prayed for, but he was serving in the temple. Okay? In our sense, when we are parents, we are giving our children back to God. We are temporarily watching over them, caring for them for 18, whatever, 20 years, however long your children care, you know, are in your home, so that you give them back to God as lifelong followers and servants of Jesus Christ. That's our prayer. That's our goal. That's our calling as parents. Now, so mothers, therefore, are to regard their children as a gift from God, as gifts from God, that we give back to God as followers of Jesus Christ. And after Hannah had given her weaned three-year-old son to God, now mind you, he's only three years old at the time when he brought him to the temple, when after Hannah had given her weaned three-year-old son to God, what was her response according to the scripture? What was her response? First Samuel chapter 2. Let's go to chapter 2 now, verse 1. Her response after giving her son at three years of age to the temple, it says in verse 1 of chapter 2, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exults in Yahweh. My horn is exalted in Yahweh. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like Yahweh, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. What you don't see in Hannah is like, oh, I have to give my son up to the temple. Well, you know, and she's the one that vowed that, right? You don't see regret. You don't see like, oh, I'm going to miss him. I mean, I'm sure she was going to miss him. But that's not what she says here, right? She gave her son back to God, not regretting it in any way. She's exalting it in it, she says. And she's praising God in doing it. It's an amazing thing as a mother. It says, she exalts. She says, my heart exalts in the Lord. The word exalts means to have, to feel triumphant jubilation. Okay. Triumphant jubilation. She has triumph. She was barren. She was taunted. She was ridiculed. She felt worthless because she was in a world where motherhood was the only option and she felt worthless. But she prayed to God and God answered her prayer and so now she exalts. She triumphs. She has felt triumphant jubilation because God has blessed her with a child and now she exalts because she's giving him back to God just like she vowed. She's giving him back to God. And so it's not a time of sorrow. Even though I'm sure it would be hard to separate from your three-year-old child, your son. But as a mother, no blessing was greater to her than to give her child back to the Lord. See, in our day, it's a little mixed up. See, you look at today's society, we often think that the greatest blessing in our society, the greatest blessing as a parent the greatest, now think of it, what is your greatest blessing as a parent? The greatest blessing as a parent, we think, is to have successful children and grandchildren, okay? You know, our children that they do well in school, that our children, you know, they eventually get good jobs and they become decent people, you know? Okay, they don't become, you know, a thief or something like that, but but they grow up and they, they, they do well in life. That's the greatest blessing as a child, you know, as, as, as a parent for your children. But really, when you think about it, is that it? Is that all you, you think is the greatest blessing is as a parent? You know, that they, they, they do well in school and they find a job and, you know, eventually get married and maybe have some grandchildren and they become decent people and, that, and that's it? Forget about their spiritual lives? See, for mothers like Hannah, their greatest blessing would to have grandchildren and grandchildren who know and love the Lord. That was her greatest blessing. That's the greatest blessing of her. So my soul exalts. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in Yahweh. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in what? Your salvation. And so for mothers like Hannah, and as for believers even today, the greatest blessing as a parent would be to have children and eventually grandchildren who know and love Jesus Christ. 
That's the greatest blessing. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in Yahweh. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. And there is none holy like Yahweh, for there is none besides you. And there is no rock like our God. See, when Hannah gave her three-year-old child now, her three-year-old child to the Lord's service, she praised God for that. Verse 3 now of chapter 2. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 3. She says, Hannah continues, Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For Yahweh is a God of knowledge. And by him, actions are weighed. She knew, Hannah knew, that the Lord is a God of knowledge. And that by him, Actions are weighed. Being a mother, being a parent can be tough. But God knows all. The the Lord is a God of knowledge. He knows all things. Okay, being a parent, being a mother especially can be tough. But God knows all. And even the motives behind our actions, okay, by him, actions are weighed. He understands them. He he knows the motives behind our actions. You're not going to be perfect. But God is a God of knowledge. He rejoices in that. Verse 4. The the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. See, Hannah knew that those who seem mighty, okay, see that, the bows of the mighty, Hannah knew that those who seem mighty in this world can be broken. And she knew that those who seem to have much may end up with little. Those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. Okay? She knew that those who are mighty in this world may, may, can be broken. And those who have seemed to have much may end up with little. And she knew, in verse 7, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. Okay, so it's the Lord who is sovereign over our lives and over our children's lives. We can plan and we can plan and we can plan. But unless the Lord is, you know, behind it, or the Lord blesses it, or the Lord is sovereign behind it, okay, it's going to happen according to what he has planned, not us. Because we're not in control of our children's destiny. We can plan but it's ultimately in God's hands. And so Hannah knew this. Hannah knew in verse 9 that he will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Not by might shall a man prevail. No matter how successful our children become, or we become for that matter, no matter how powerful, no matter how wealthy that our children become, it is not by might that a man shall prevail. It's not by wealth that a man shall prevail. It's not by their education that a man shall prevail. It's not by their own success that a man shall prevail. No. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones. But the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. Verse 9. For not by might shall a man prevail. But rather, those who are faithful. Those are the ones who will fail. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones. For uh, back in verse 2 of of chapter 2, for there is no rock like our God. He's our rock. He's our rock as our parent. And when you are a parent and you're going through challenges, He's your rock. He's the one that has all knowledge. He has the one that understands motives. He is the one that raises up. He's the one that, that pulls down. He's the one that is sovereign over our life. He's the one that's sovereign over our children. Therefore, do we understand that? There is no rock like our God. 
Because it's so easy to today to buy into the world standard of what it means to be successful. What it means for our children to be successful. It's so easy just to buy into the worldly value system that tells us, that dictates to us what it means to have successful children or to be successful in this world. The world standards of what is beautiful. It's so easy to find, you know, to, to, to fall into, well, the world says I need to be like this. I need to look like this. Okay? The world standard of what is beautiful. The world standards of who has worth. Who has value. Parents and children have it tough. Okay? We've always had it tough, and today is no different. Parents and children have it very tough. Because the world tells us one thing, but God says another oftentimes when it comes to what success is, what it means to be a, a successful parent, what it means to be a child of God. The world tells us one thing, but God tells us another. When social media, for example, when we, what we see on the internet, what we see in the media, tells us, that says that this is what success looks like. Look, this is what success looks like. But God says in his word, what? The greatest shall be your servant. The greatest shall be your servant. That's what God says. But the world doesn't say that. The world says, this is what success looks like. When the world says, take. But God says, give. Okay? It is more blessed to give than to receive. But the world says, take. Go for the gusto. You know, do what's best for you. But God says, give. These are the values, some of the values that we buy into that are contrary to what God says is important. And, and as mothers and as fathers, we must learn to trust in Jesus, to teach our children to trust in Jesus. Because that's how we're going to live on as lifelong followers of Christ, to learn to trust in Christ. But we as parents need to trust in Christ. We have to model that trust in Christ so that they will catch that idea of trusting in Jesus. Because we can't just tell them to trust in Jesus if we don't trust in Jesus, obviously. Okay, it's it's got to be caught, not taught. Okay, it's something that they learn from us, from our own trust in Jesus. And so we must learn to trust in Jesus and then teach our children to trust in Jesus. Because otherwise we will fall into the world's standards of success. We must listen to who God says that we are in Christ. We must listen to what God says we are in Christ. And what does God say? Romans chapter 9, verse 25. Those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. That's who God says you are. You are his beloved. We are all his beloved people. You are loved. You have value. You have worth. It doesn't matter if the world says, well, to order to have value, you must look like this, or you must have accomplished this, or you must... It doesn't matter what the world says. God says you are his beloved. We need to teach our children that. We need to experience that for ourselves so that we can teach them to trust in Christ alone. And so when our children follow Jesus Christ, it is God who enabled it to happen. Yeah, I take no credit, or we take no credit as parents. If our children learn to follow Christ, it's not because of me as a parent, or of you as a parent. It's because God has enabled it to happen. And he gets the glory. God is to get the glory because they're only his gifts given to me temporarily, given to us temporarily, and we just give them back to him. And so it's God who has enabled them to follow Christ, and he is the one who gets the glory. Mothers are to see that their children, as a gift from God, to be given back to God as followers of Jesus Christ. And when our children follow Jesus, okay, we give God the glory for that. And now after Hannah had given her son over to the Lord, was her role as a mother done? Okay, now she had done what she said she was going to do. She, she, she prayed for a child. She was given a son. And she gave him back to the Lord at age three. Then, after she gave him over to the Lord, was her work as a mother done? Absolutely not. Hannah's son Samuel became a servant of the high priest. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. 
Then Elkanah, meaning Hannah's husband, went home to Ramah. And the boy was ministering to Yahweh in the presence of Eli the priest. The boy was ministering to Yahweh in the presence of the priest. And he became a servant of the high priest. But just because Samuel was now lived in the temple from that day forward, didn't mean that Hannah stopped being a mother. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 18. Samuel was ministering before Yahweh, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. And his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year. And she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May Yahweh give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of Yahweh. And so they would return to their home. And indeed, Yahweh visited Hannah and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of Yahweh. So what you see is that even though she had given her son Samuel, the oldest son, to the Lord's service in the temple, that Hannah, it says, continued to check in on her son. See that? She continued to check in on her son and she made him, even made him brand new, a brand new robe every year. Every year she made him a new robe. She never forgot about her son. She never stopped checking in on him. And she made him a brand new robe every year when he outgrew the previous one. And Eli the priest noticed this devotion of Samuel's mother, Hannah, in giving them their young son to the Lord's service. Saying in verse 20, Eli would bless Elkanah's wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition that she asked of Yahweh. And so then they would return to their home. Verse 21. Indeed, Yahweh visited Hannah and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters and the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of Yahweh. So the Lord blessed Hannah with five more children, it says. After this, the Lord blessed her with five more children. And Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord, it says at the end of verse 21. The boy Samuel grew in the presence of Yahweh. Samuel became one of the greatest prophets in the history of Israel. One of the greatest prophets in the history of Israel. He would become instrumental in establishing the first two kings of Israel. King Saul and King David. He personally anointed both of the first two kings of Israel. In fact, Eli, the high priest, his own two sons became wicked, as we see later on in the book of 1 Samuel. They became wicked and eventually would die in battle. And so God used Samuel to lead his people until he anointed the kings that God had chosen. He eventually became the de facto leader of the people of Israel because the high priest's sons became wicked and they died. Now, the point of all this was that Hannah did not regret giving her son Samuel to the Lord's service. The day that she brought him at age three, she did not regret it. You don't see regret. And, oh, you know, I wish I didn't have to give him up. Oh, you know, it's so sad. I mean, I'm sure she felt sad as any mother would. But what you see is her praising God. Hannah did not regret giving her son to Samuel to the Lord's service. She supported it. She came every year. She checked in on him every year. And made him a new new robe every year. And as her son, quote, grew in the presence of the Lord, verse 21, he would then turn God's people back to God. He himself would turn God's people back. First Samuel chapter 7, verse 3. And this is when Samuel became an adult. And Samuel said to all the houses of Israel, house of Israel, if you are returning to Yahweh with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and direct your heart to Yahweh and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served Yahweh only. And then Samuel said, Gather all of Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to Yahweh for you. And so they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before Yahweh, and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against Yahweh, and Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. He became the de facto leader of God's people, turning God's people back, saying, repent of your sin, 
come back. He would be instrumental in, in anointing the first two kings of Israel. Okay? These are incredible things when you think of how she started. What greater joy was there for Hannah as a mother, who at first had no children, right? At first had no children. She wept before the Lord and she prayed for a child. And then God gave her a son and she gave the son back to God as she promised. And then that son, that very son that she gave back to God would be used by God to turn God's people back to him to serve the Lord and he would anoint two kings. And so Hannah's words in verse 10, chapter 2, verse 10, were prophetic. Chapter 2, verse 10 of 1 Samuel. The adversaries of Yahweh shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. Yahweh will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now, mind you, when did Hannah uh, say that? Okay, was there a king yet in Israel? No. Okay, This is after she just gave over the son at age three to the temple and she's already praying this prayer and she's saying, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king. There was no king yet. So the words of Hannah were prophetic. The Lord will give the judge, the answer, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Okay, All the things that transpired in Hannah's life and all then in her son's life were prophetically were carried out by God himself. God is the one that knew that there were going to be two kings and, and her son would be the one to anoint them. So Hannah's words were indeed prophetic in chapter uh, 2, verse 10. And to think that all the things that transpired in Hannah's life and in Hannah's son's life, and to think that all of this started how? All of it started with a mother's prayer. That's how this all started, back in chapter 1. It started with a barren, childless mother, weeping, feeling worthless, praying to God. It started all of this the course of history was changed. The course of God's will was carried out because of a mother's prayer. Never underestimate the power of prayer. Never underestimate the power of a mother's prayer. Look what Hannah's prayer led to. Look what Hannah's prayer accomplished. She had never, no idea that it would accomplish so much. She became the, the mother of a, of a man, Samuel, who would anoint two kings. And that king became, the second king, David, would become the ancestor of Jesus Christ himself. How would she know that? She didn't, but she prayed. All started with a mother's prayer. And so I encourage you as mothers, I encourage you as fathers, it's never too late to or too early to pray for your children. It's never too late to pray for your children. You can't say, oh, my child's already up in years. Oh, they're already adults already. You know, it's too late. No, it's not. It's never too late to pray for your children. You say, oh, my child's not even born yet. It's never too early. Pray for your children. Pray for your children. Don't believe the devil's lies. Saying that, you know, it's not going to mean much. Oh, you don't see any fruit from your prayers. Hey, Hannah didn't see any fruit until after she was probably dead by the time that he anointed two kings. She, she probably never got to see that. But look all the things that transpired that all started with her prayer. It all started with her prayers. And look what it led to. Look at the the changes that were made in God's plan for his people because of her prayer. It all began there. Yes, don't believe the devil's lies that your prayers don't mean much. They mean a lot. Pray for your children as mothers, as fathers. Never underestimate the power of a mother's prayers. They can move mountains. They can make history. And that's what we see. Children are a gift from God and so that will give them back to God as followers of Jesus Christ. And when children follow Jesus, when they actually do follow Jesus, God gets the glory. God gets the glory. Never underestimate the power of a mother's prayers. It can do and accomplish great things. Great things. Father, we pray that we would take to heart this high calling as mothers, and fathers. That, Father, it's truly a gift from you that we become parents. 
And that gift of what you give to us temporarily on earth is only so that we can give it back to you as followers of Jesus Christ. And it's never too late to pray for our children toward that end. It's never too late or too early to pray for our children because we know that even with Hannah's prayer, what a, what a change uh, it, it, it brought about among your people. What, what great fruit came out of her prayer eventually in her son Samuel. Teach us, O oh God, to trust you, to follow you, to teach our children to trust and follow you as well. We thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.